what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X. Uh, founder Tony Horton, he talked about how he made money as a street mine before selling hundreds of millions of dollars. Baby Einstein founder Julie Clark talks about growing her company to $20 million with five employees and selling to Disney, but most impressively beat cancer twice. And Atari founder Nolan Bushnell talked about, and we'll talk with Mitch, who is the early days of the internet too. Um, Nolan Bushnell talked about how when Steve Jobs, he was Steve Jobs' mentor, Steve offered him 33% of Apple for $50,000 and why he said no. Um, Check out more interviews on inspiredinsider.com. This episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran, who Mitch also knows. At Rise25, we help B2B businesses connect to their Dream 100 clients and referral partners. We help you create a roadmap for the next year to the exact referral partners and clients to connect with and the content you should be creating. And we help you run your podcast so it generates ROI. And podcasting, you know, for me is much more personal. Um, it's not just about your business, it's about leaving a legacy. Um, it was inspired by my grandfather and he was a Holocaust survivor and him and his brother were in concentration camps in Nazi Germany. They were the only members of their family to survive and his legacy lives on because the Holocaust Foundation did an interview with him, which I put on my about page. So if people are interested, mm-hmm. they could check that out. So yes, podcasting will help your business, but it will help you and your guests leave a legacy of knowledge and I personally credit podcasting as the single best thing I've done for my business and my life. So if you have questions, and I think just like Mitch thinks any business that is the right business for certifications should have a certification, period. I believe if you have a business, you should have a podcast, period. So go to rise25.com. You can check out more. Contact us if you have questions. So today's guest I'm excited about, Mitch Russo. He is known as the go-to person to help companies build a certification program. So if you are thinking about creating a certification program or you don't know that you should be creating it, go to mitchrusso.com. Check out what he's about. He's been doing this for decades. Um, His past clients and partners include Tony Robbins, Kevin Harrington, Chet Holmes, Josh Turner, and many more. Talk about Dream 100, right? Chet Holmes was ta- was talking about that decades ago also. In 1985, just to give you some background on Mitch, um, he co-founded Time Slips Corporation, which grew to become the largest time tracking software company in the world at the time. And in 94, Time Slips was sold to Sage for over $10 million. And Mitch went on to run all of Sage US as COO, a division with 300 people. Sage is huge. I went to the Sage Summit conference. It's it's huge. All the top, you know, software and counting and things like that go to this conference. Um, he partnered with Chet Holmes and Tony Robbins to help create business breakthroughs, a company serving thousands of businesses a year with coaching, consulting, and training. And Mitch was the president and CEO and helped grow that company to over $25 million. And he's published several books, which you should check out. The Invisible Organization, which uh, is a CEO's guide to transitioning a traditional brick and mortar company into a fully virtual organization. And the book Power Tribes, which is how certification can explode your business. Check everything out at MitchRosso.com. You know, I want to hear some interesting story. I know you have a lot of interesting stories. Tony Robbins, Kevin Harrington, Chet Holmes. But I want to start with the most important, uh, which is your dad. Um, yeah. Your early mentor, he, I believe, started candy stores. What That's was right. he? Yeah, he started candy right. stores. So w- talk about a little bit what you learned from your dad and what you saw him doing, how you helped, you know, what you did early on as a kid, because I'm sure that, you know, kind of fueled your entrepreneur spirit. Absolutely. And I, I dedicated my, my second book to my dad who's passed, but mm, he, you know, he taught me that. so much. Um, I remember one day uh, I'm at the store. We just finished. He finished building a brand new store on Canal Street in New York. And uh, they're installing the, the roaster. The, they, his stores all had nut roasters because they always had fresh nuts. But he's installing the nut roaster in the front of the store, venting out the window. Mm. So they cut the window. And I said, Dad, why don't you put that in the back? You're blocking the window. And he goes, watch. I'll show you why. And he puts a batch of cashews in, and he turns on the roaster. 
And 45 minutes at 8 o'clock in the morning, 45 minutes later, we had a line outside the store. Wow. So People I were said, just walking by. Yeah. Where is that coming from? <laughs> That's right. That's right. So my dad taught me marketing in mm. in the most basic way. And he he didn't. He wasn't a copywriter. I mean, there wasn't any of that stuff going on. He just understood the psychology of how to generate people wanting things. Mm-hmm. And he, he, he did this over and over again in many of his businesses. Um, one, one day it was, a, it was, a, it was um, uh, Easter. And uh, he, he said to me, uh, tomorrow, it was the day before Easter, he said, tomorrow uh, we're getting up early and we're going into New York. Uh, and I said, great, because I always loved hanging with my dad. I said, what are we doing? He goes, we're selling Easter baskets. I said, really? Uh, you mean we're opening the store? He goes, no, no, the store's closed. Uh, we're, we're selling Easter baskets. I said, where? He goes, I'm not, I'm not sure yet. So we're driving around now Sunday morning, and, and we're, we're just driving. And then all of a sudden he goes, okay, let's stop. And on the street there was a door that someone had thrown away. So he found two boxes and he propped up the door and then we emptied the car of all the baskets that we had and we set up on the street, on a random street corner and we sold every basket that we could fit into the car before 11 a.m. Wow. I mean, my dad just knew that if you, on Easter, came up with Easter baskets and showed up in a public place, you'd sell them. (laughs) And it was intuitive stuff like this. Yeah, he just had a knack for looking around, where's the best spot? And he found the spot on the corner that's trafficked and just set up shop. Yeah, yeah. And to him, shop was a door. It was just a discarded door (laughs) balanced by a couple of boxes. I mean, that's the stuff that, I mean, and those lessons are really how I started Time Slips. Mm. You know, we only started the company with $5,000 and that doesn't go very far. Um, And so we went to our first trade show Um, I literally, I mean, imagine walking into legal tech in New York City, and the only thing we could afford was the sign, the paper sign, and the table. We couldn't even afford the, the, the skirt on the table, so we brought a sheet. And now we throw the sheet on the table, and Talk about bootstrapping. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And we put this, this basically a rented television set connected to a laptop, and we were the most popular booth in the entire show. All these multi-million dollar booths, Thompson and Company, all these big legal software names. We had more traffic than all of them because we had something new and exciting and, and it was causing a buzz. So a lot of that came from just watching how my dad did stuff, you know? What was, what was your dad's stores like? What was in there? You mentioned the, the nuts. What else did oh, he have in there? Well, he had, so, so my, my, um, my dad, on my dad's side, my family is from Turkey, mm-hmm. and and so they imported halva for the first time mm. into the United States. So we used to get these big wheels of halva, and and we would slice it up and give people tastes, and we'd sell the whole wheel out that day. You know, so um, we would sell more. We sold standard stuff, packaged candy to some degree, but most of the store <clears throat> were custom things. Like for example. Um, he would take caramel nuts and chocolate and put them in a little paper cup and sell them for 25 cents. Well, the cost of that, th- those ingredients, the cost of that was less than three cents. But he would never be able to get those type of profit margins on packaged candy. Mm. So he figured out what would be the best and unique and profitable and offer it to people. And it was, it was all, he was just about always right. Mitch, take me back to that time candy wise. What were your favorite candies? What was the candy of that of that time? Like the package candy of that era? Well, I mean, clearly there was Pez, there was mm. uh, you know, there was Good and Plenty. That was one of my favorites. Mm. Um there were um I'm trying to remember the name of them. Jeez, I, I wish you would have prepared me. I would have done the research. <laughs> now, I will tell you this. Uh you're you're in New York, aren't you? Uh, Chicago. So you said that. Sorry, yeah. Chicago. Well, in New York there's a store called Economy Candy, and that store was founded by my dad and his father, my grandfather. Wow. Uh, and it's still there to this day. And so we would uh, go to the candy store, uh, you know, when in the early days, and I would work there at the store and 
I learned a lot about business and transactions and inventory from just hanging out at the store with my dad. Um, and so when he built the store, he chose candies that were unusual as opposed to the regular stuff. But the stuff that I really liked, uh, and I'm, I'm just thinking now as I'm, I'm going back to some of the uh, old time favorites from that day. I mean, I don't know if you remember a, a thing called uh, Rocky Road which was like a, a chocolate bar. I loved those. And of course, there was always Pez and, and uh, I don't know, licorice, strings of licorice. Um, I mean, all that stuff. Uh, I, I wasn't a big baseball fan, but, you know, I loved baseball cards, mostly for the gum. Yes. So, you know, it was just stuff Rock like solid gum has been in the package Rock for, for a year or two years. I'll still eat it. Um, yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, any other lessons that really stick out from your dad? that he either he you know sat you down and talked to you or he just ob observing well you know it was very interesting we my dad uh was a depression era dad and he grew up in the depression era and he told us all the stories of how he had to melt lead out of the milk containers to get enough money to feed the family when he was a little boy and but the story that the, the phrase that he left me with which served me so well, and I've taught this to many people, I've mentioned it many times. He says, you know, Mitchell, money is round. It rolls in and it rolls out. Hmm. And his point was, don't get infatuated by money because it comes and goes. Hmm. And if, if you don't want it to come and go, you need to learn how to make it stay. And to me, that was like an incredible lesson. I have watched many of my contemporaries back in the 80s and 90s sell their companies and later be penniless basically working you know working at jobs why because they didn't understand that money is round you know unless you're careful it's going to roll out after it rolled in <laughs> yeah and so that was one of my favorite things that he taught me yeah thanks for sharing that um tony robbins story favorite tony robbins story uh, I know there's a bunch. I know there's one that involves your daughter. Uh, I don't know. But, you know, a story that kind of talks about your uh, relationship with Tony Robbins and his, his lesson that he imparted on you. Well, I mean, if I were to go back and try and <clears throat> distill and encapsulate everything I've learned from Tony, it would take a long time. But the thing that sticks out to me is the integrity of the spoken word. Um, Tony has a way of never speaking before he thinks. Tony doesn't get, I mean, people will disagree because they're only looking at the surface. Tony doesn't get angry. He gets urgent. And there's a big difference. Hmm. I've watched how he treats people when he gets urgent versus others when they get angry. And he treats everyone everyone with respect. And more importantly, he understands the psychology of how problems are solved. He also understands a deeper level. One of the things I learned from Tony, and I'll never forget this, is that when there's an issue between people, many times there's a secretive third party to blame. And I didn't understand this until I watched him dissect the problem right in front of my eyes, where there was a third party spreading rumors about one of the two people that were in the middle of this disagreement. And immediately I said to myself, why isn't he dealing with the problem? And because I didn't, because I figured he would deal with the two people in particular, but instead he dealt with, he went deeper and found out who the third party was, who was telling them what this other person quote unquote did and they didn't. But it wasn't until I watched him do that that I truly understood that there's a whole nother level of human psychology that Tony plays with in his toolbox every single day that is beyond extraordinary. And and I learned a lot of that from him throughout the years. And I told you before, I learned I learned how to help <clears throat> people create training programs that guarantee 100% uh, comprehension. And it's not that it's hard, by the way. It's just that if you got to pay attention carefully to these several important points. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Mitch, Chet Holmes. Oh, goodness. Um, <clears throat> Chet and I um, met each other because he was a salesman calling on me. 
And he was trying to sell me advertising uh, when I was building time slips. And he was so persistent that it was almost a joke. It was like he was a a a character in a comic book. His persistence. What was, was he doing? Well, he would never give up. He would never stop calling. He would never stop mailing me things. He would never stop visiting. I mean, this guy was the the. If you looked up persistence in the dictionary, his face would be there. He would just the type of person that when he wanted something, he would not stop until he got it. He used to tell the story that it took 17 years to get in front of Tony Robbins to have that conversation. And when he did, we built the company together. So Chet was a master at understanding how to get people to do things in a way that benefited them. And if you've read his book, The Ultimate Sales Machine, which is a Bible of mine, Someone said that I'm in the book four times. I think he uses me as a reference. He uses me as a testimonial and all this other stuff. We were, we were best friends. I mean, we built our friendship. He said to me one day, he said to me, he goes, you and I, we're going to be best friends. You'll see. Hmm. I, I mean, bought I, that book and I printed, uh, bought it. There was a, a online version. I printed it out and put it in a binder. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> to tell you the truth, the book is so packed with incredible wisdom. Um, and now that he's gone, of course, you know, it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's a classic, but the things in that book are the things we lived every day. You know, all of the stuff that he teaches in that book are the elements of how we built business breakthroughs. So, you know, when he talked about core story, we built a core story division. Uh, when he talked about dream 100, we built an entire sales division around dream 100. We ate our own dog food. We used all the tools to create business breakthroughs. And uh, one of the chapters in the book became how he and I got started working together, chapter five, uh, which is basically how to hire sales superstars. And it turns out that uh, I jumped in and started to help him and Ted uh, do some hiring until eventually, you know, when I started seeing how they were doing it, I said, there's got to be a better way. And I started using some of my so software and technology skills and automated the entire process. And so once I did, I perfected it even deeper than Chet had in the book. Chet told me before he died that I actually interviewed more people than he ever did. Um, and so a lot of what I learned from Chet were the core elements. And then I would need to take them to the next level to make them useful to me in, in implementing in the business. Uh, but, I mean, Chet was the type of guy, we'd go to Las Vegas for a trade show. And he said, come on, come on, let's go. I said, where are we going? He goes, we're going to over to we're going to sneak into the theater and sit in the front row of the show that's going on right now. I said, "Yeah, but we don't have tickets." He goes, "I nah, don't worry about it. Come on." And I would go with him. You know, I'd say and I would, and my ethics would be I would never, you know, steal anything and that's kind of like stealing, but it was so much fun and that was his nature was mischievous, you know, and and so I would I I became his, his sidekick, if you will, in so many cases. So we would do things like that all the time. But Chet loved life, you know, he loved his family. Um we had an incredible friendship. Uh, and then unfortunately, you know, uh, when he when he contracted leukemia, um, one of the first things that happened to him was he had a mini stroke. And uh, wow. a lot of the barrier between emotions and thinking sort of got distorted for him. And a lot of the raw emotion uh, of being disappointed about being sick and even deeper started to come out. Uh, as it does in many people who who have uh, strokes of that sort. So it became very difficult in the last 16, 18 months with Chet. I, I, I was there the, the day before he died in his room talking to him. Mm. Next next morning, he was gone. I left that he was night. really young, Mitch. 53. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, he was. Wow. He was. Thanks for sharing some of those stories. Um, and and I, I remember his book. I, I've read the book. It's amazing. Um, I always ask this, Mitch, since it's Inspired Insider, I always ask what's been an especially low moment that you had to push through? Because as you know, as a entrepreneur, business owner, there's just lots of, of moments that are ups and downs. And then what's been a proud moment on the other side of things? What's been um, a challenging moment? moment or low moment you remember that you had to really push through this week this month this year this quarter I this mean, hour you, no this i mean hour. yeah I'll i tell mean, you just the, anything in the, in yeah. the past that that 
strikes you. Yeah. I got a great story. Okay. So, so when I met my partner, Neil, um, the way we met was because I was having a problem with trying to deduct my personal computer from my taxes. And so I shared that problem with my brand new next door neighbor, Neil, Neil Ayer. And um, we, we became friends. We started going to lunch and breakfast. And I told them, look, the only way I can solve this problem is I have to write a software program to keep records of usage on my computer. And without two beats, six weeks later, he shows up at my house, tells me to come on over. And he shows me a program that he wrote to keep track of time on the computer. And I had this declaration. He said, you know, we could sell a couple of these. Those were my words. And uh, so we continued to meet for breakfast and refine the process. And meanwhile, I wrote the manual and, and he wrote the software. And I started figuring out how to build the business and what channels, blah, blah, blah. Well, we both quit our jobs. My job was in sales. I was selling semiconductors. I quit and I was now working full time for my own company, Time Slips Corporation. He did the same thing. The day after we quit, the IRS relaxed the rulings on contemporaneous record keeping. So the last nine months of work were now completely gone. No purpose whatsoever. Let's call that a disappointment, a disappointing moment. A little bit, yeah. Yeah. So we had burned the boats. So at this point, there was no going back. So uh, after throwing some stuff around and screaming and ranting and raving, we said, okay, what do we got? Let's do an assessment here. What do we got? We got this software. It's pretty amazing. Uh, what can we do with it? Who else might use it? Who else might need it? And then we came up with the idea of maybe lawyers could. Maybe we could use it to build time. And so we did a pivot at that time. We ended up going another three months to finish the software and build it out so that it's at least MVP, mini minimally viable product, so that we could sell it. And that one mistake, that mistake of building the wrong thing first, was the blessing that turned us into a, a eight-figure company. So had we not had that not happened to us and we given up and walked away, we would have both been back at jobs three months later. Instead, we built this incredible company together. So, you know, and one of the greatest um, moments in my life uh, is also part of that story, too, because my partner happens to have been his family is a very wealthy, wealthy, wealthy family. Uh, they have a building somewhere that does nothing but manage the family's money. I'm sure you know what those are like. Well, he grew up feeling useless throughout his life. Uh, he couldn't get a job because mm. people realized that he doesn't even care about the money, which wasn't really true, but that's what they thought. So his, unfortunately, rich the, the children of rich people suffer in this way because they never really have a purpose as it relates to money. But when we sold the company, he actually put millions of dollars back into the family trust and was the first person in 200 years wow. to, to do that. And he gave me all the credit, which I didn't deserve. And to his family, he was a hero hmm. be because he was the only one to ever actually go back and return money to the trust. And I was... I was a member of the family from the day that we began our business together. Uh, mm. I became a member of his family and I was treated that way. And, and, uh, and, and he's today still one of my best friends in the world. Wow. Mitch, I want to be the first one to thank you. This has been absolutely fantastic. I want to point people towards your website, MitchRusso.com. They can also go to MyPowerTribe.com. Anywhere else we should point people towards online to check out more about what you're working on. Yeah, they can go to PowerTribesBook.com and get the free course that goes with that it. That sounds fantastic. I'm going to get it now. So, cool. Mitch, thank you again. My pleasure. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.